Hey, y'all. I'm Sam Sanders, host of NPR's It's Been a Minute. I'm also an occasional fourth chair with my friends over at Pop Culture Happy Hour. And I'm so excited to be a part of and be with you tonight to celebrate 10 years of Pop Culture Happy Hour. Uh, I hope you all have your drinks of choice to toast the PCHH gang. Perhaps it might be one of the custom cocktails that were made for this event. Uh, they're really good. Stephen Thompson's Notes of Skittles. Yes, it involves Skittles. Glenn Weldon's Biceps, because why not? Or Linda Holmes' a MacGuffin. If you're just sipping on kombucha or whatever, I support the endeavor. This public radio after all, kombucha is always welcome. Uh, but seriously, shout out to DC-based beverage director, uh, Adam Bernbach. He made these special drink recipes. Also thanks to Charles Lee and uh, Marissa LaRusso for naming the drinks. Uh, they're wonderful names. All right, for those watching out there, be sure to show us how you are celebrating this birthday for PCHH by using the hashtag PCHH on all social media. Some producers will also be in the comments here on YouTube and they would love to hear from you there as well. Uh, all right, about tonight, it's gonna be super fun. We're gonna take you behind the scenes on how the show gets made from home and then we'll spend a few minutes to look back on the past decade, decade of Pop Culture Happy Hour. And then I will swap out for a super distinguished guest, Kumail Nanjiani, because I'm not brave enough to do one of these famous Alinda Holmes quizzes myself, but he is, because he's like a superhero, actually. Like, that's his job right now. Uh, also, of course, the gang, as always, will tell you what's making them happy this week. So without further ado, let's uh, bring on the host of Pop Culture Happy Hour, my friend, my role model, Linda Holmes. Hi, Linda. Come on. Hi. Hi, Sam. It's How so are good. you? Happy birthday. Hi. I'm good. Thank you so much. This is very, very exciting. We appreciate so much that you did this. We, of course, originally planned to have a, uh, a live event in D.C. We wanted to see everybody in person. The good news about this event is that um, you guys can, uh, all of you can wear sweatpants to it. Uh, we could, too. I'm not going to tell you whether we are. You don't know. You don't need to know. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, um, if you've ever had trouble making it to one of our events because they're in D.C., we were in a way there's the silver lining of the fact that we're able to welcome so many of you uh, from so many different places. And of course, uh, Sam does not have to get on a plane to come across the country <laughs> to do yeah. this. with us. Um, we have, by the way, RSVPs to this event from all 50 states plus DC. I'm going to give you uh, some of the places people are watching from uh, San Antonio and Houston, Texas, Sam, uh -huh. uh, Tokyo, Japan, Toronto, Rio, Mexico, Arizona, Raleigh and Durham and Wake Forest, North Carolina, Cambridge, Mass, Los Angeles and Oakland and San Francisco and Lake Tahoe, California, Baltimore, Illinois, Tallahassee. Oh, and of course, my beloved St. Paul, Minnesota. Hi, St. Paul, Minnesota. I see you. Well, we could sit here all night. We could do our own virtual happy hour. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I think we need to bring out my partners in crime. I'm going to look at these guys and say, you guys, look what happened. Uh, Stephen Thompson and Glenn Weldon. Welcome. Hey. 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 Uh, Real quick, I was going to do a bit uh, at this top here. I was going to, when the camera came on, I was going to be doing curls and then turn to the camera and go, oh, uh, I didn't see you come in. But then uh, I remembered that uh, we've got Kamel Nanjiani on the show. So uh, I don't want to invite comparisons between, you know, his pythons and my uh, garter snakes. All right. Wow. All right. Let's not be quite so needy right off the bat. Uh, so if you're if you're if you're enjoying uh, if you're watching us from home, you'll see that um, I am in what I call my blanket booth. Uh, beautiful blankets all around me, by the way. My mom crocheted this one. Beautiful, nice. thanks, mom. Uh, Stephen, you are. Uh, what? Tell the people where you are. Well, I am entombed in my the closet of my game room. So I'm I've got blankets <laughs> nailed to the wall. I'm surrounded by blankets and uh, about 20 feet from the fridge, which is right where I like to be. Good stuff. Yeah. And uh, where are you, Glenn? Uh, the cabin has a loft. The loft has a tiny little bathroom and it goes right into the A-frame of the house. So it's very tiny. We put up uh, dog blankets and throw pillows to baffle the sound. Uh, there is no air in here. It is very warm. So I am holding my own little uh, wet t-shirt contest in here uh, in about five to ten minutes. And uh, here's a game you can play at home, kids. Uh, how long until Glenn's face turns into a steamed meat dumpling? <laughs> 
it goes, it's gonna happen. <laughs> we're all, I think we're all gonna get sweaty if I'm being totally honest, which is the way I like to, to start every live event. Oh yeah, sweat is good, sweat is good. All right, so one of the things that we get to do at all of our live in-person shows is we show the audience how the sausage gets made, how we put our different podcasts together. We usually start by sitting around and having folks in the audience make a lot of noise. And then we ask y'all to get really quiet as we record different sections of the show. Uh, since we might use some of the audio from this virtual event for a podcast episode, we're gonna do the same thing right here tonight, just uh, from our homes. All right, I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take the the time to do our normal setup that we do before we tape the show. We're gonna do our 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 levels check slash our pee pop check. Uh, Stephen, you want to go first on the levels check? Sure. Uh, Peter Piper picked a peck of the NPR Politics podcast. If Peter Piper picked a peck of the NPR Politics podcast, how many NPR Politics podcasts did Peter Piper pick? Now you would think that that was the most show offy of pee pop check. <laughs> But that's only because you haven't heard the next one. <laughs> Glenn Weldon, give me your peepock check. Okay, watch me pace this pathetic palooka with a powerful, paralyzing, perfect pachydermic percussion pitch. Blue perfect, Pangea, peripatetic. Literally goes okay. to slurpy, blue perfect, Pangea, peripatetic every single time. I didn't used to know that Bugs Bunny uh, bit, but now I do, of course. Um, I typically, um, and this is no lie, I typically don't have as many P-pop issues as these guys do, so I usually just talk about my dog while I check my levels. Mm -hmm. He's downstairs. Hopefully he's not going to bark or cry uh, during this event, um, and my levels look okay. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to go to a um, uh, the intro that you would normally hear at the top of the show. Uh, yeah. There you go. Intro radio magic. Uh, so it is y'all's 10th birthday. Seems like that's a very good milestone uh, to look back upon. Mm -hmm. My job was made so easy because your fans sent in literally hundreds of questions for you. So I want to dive into a few of those questions right now. Uh, cool. And audience, we got a lot of similar questions. So please be patient with us and know that we can't get to all of them tonight. But we saw them all. Thank you for sending those in. Uh, all right. So let's start with the basics. This question is from Ashanka K. In Texas, and she asked, what's the origin story of PCHH? And along those same lines, Gabriella D from New York wants to know, what were your first impressions of each other? And how do you feel like your relationships to each other as hosts, as friends, as coworkers have evolved over these past 10 years? Oh, wow. You want to tell the origin story, Thompson? Sure. I, I think I can kind of answer both those questions at once a little bit. My first impression of Linda Holmes on this show is that we were already best friends. And we started the show sitting in my living room, probably about 10 or 15 feet from where I am right now, uh, drinking Wisconsin beers and just kind of talking about how nice it would be to do a podcast together. And over the course of like five or 10 minutes, uh, we kind of ha hashed out the name of the show, the concept of the show, the cast of the show, uh, who might help us produce the show. It happened very organically and it kind of was the roots of everything that we continue to do to this day started there. As far as uh, first impressions of Glenn, I met Glenn Weldon as we were walking into the studio to record the very first episode of the show. And uh, th that chemistry was a big part of of why we knew we wanted to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah you have thoughts, Glenn? Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, it was Trey Graham who brought me on to NPR uh, through, I was a contributing freelancer, uh, and uh, he was, at the time, the uh, movie editor for uh, NPR.org, and he was also one of the OG fourth chair. So I got into the show uh, through that, and I, I pretty much wrote my entire career, uh, as it stands now, to Trey. Uh, I've said that many times. What a lot of people might not know is that for the first six years of the show, because I had a day job at which I was miserable, um, meaning I, I hated it and I also was terrible at it, uh, you guys <laughs> were so kind to uh, work around my schedule. So I would get off work at six, schlep across town for half an hour, and we would tape the show at night, because, and you guys would rearrange your schedules, and I, I hugely appreciate that, and it just means the, the damn world to me. I mean, yes, but it's also true that we did not necessarily officially have permission to be making the show. There was so also that. It was also helpful to tape it when no one else was going to want the studio, except for interns with whom we did occasionally get into pitched uh, battles. <laughs> they were working on intern projects and we would have to get into it uh, with some of them. But, uh, but yeah, lots of fun. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. All right, next question from Ryan S. in Virginia. 
He wrote, in your varied and learned opinions, what is the most significant pop culture event, moment, contribution of the last 10 years? Y'all can answer, but I'm going to go first and just say lemonade. Sorry. Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Go ahead, Thompson. Yeah, I mean, Lemonade is actually a pretty decent answer. I would actually take it back a couple years earlier and talk about Beyonce's self-titled album, which was dropped with absolutely no warning. And I think in a way it kind of was a catalyst for a pop music arms race where where it sort of kind of seemed to compel this constant leveling up where each uh, like really, really mainstream pop album had to be bigger and bigger kind of in concept and execution than the one before it. And I think Beyonce is is certainly like kind of the key culprit in kind of constantly leveling up in terms of quality. You get up to that like homecoming show where you see how she put together this gigantic live show. And I just feel like each each time a pop star puts out a record, it has to somehow be bigger than the one before it. And I think that was one of the, the real themes of the decade for me, uh, kind of from the standpoint of, of, mu- of music over the course of the 2010s. Yep. Glenn? Um, for me, I mean, I guess I mean, an argument could be made that it's podcasting, right? I mean, I don't think we should be the ones making that <laughs> argument, but I think, I, think, I think that's a valid argument. But no, I'm going to be rigorously on brand and uh, kind of a bummer and say that it's uh, the rise of nerd culture, to coin a phrase. Because in 2010, what was on everybody's lips? It was uh, Iron Man 2. Uh, and it was on everybody's lips because they were spitting it out because that was not a good movie. But... We didn't know then, right? Because nerds like me were still in that first flush of excitement thinking that we won. Like, now it's nerds who rule and jocks who drool. But in the last 10 years, we've really discovered that nerds can be much worse bullies than jocks ever were uh, because they have this sense of persecution and that they cling to that because that's part of their identity. So uh, they can't accept that what they love is now loved by everybody. It's not just mainstream. It's kind of basic. So what they're doing now is they're trying to act as gatekeepers. They're self-elected gatekeepers who are trying to keep, uh, name it, games, books, comics, movies, television from evolving, right? And, and, and making the world look more like the world looks now. So they're, they're clinging to this vision of the way the world they used to look. Uh, so uh, uh, yay, I guess. <laughs> not, not, not happy, but... That's, that is a bummer. That is kind of a bummer, yeah. buddy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am going to go with a fairly obvious answer that I think I've actually given on Twitter to this same uh, question before when we asked about the decade, which is, I would just say Hamilton for the reason that um, not only because it brings together a number of different things, I don't know if you've heard this, but it brings together like Broadway and hip hop and rap, but um, but also because it, it, redistrib- it distributed power to a lot of people who I think have become really significant um, movers, you know, they're, they're not necessarily any better artists than they were before, but they have more power, right? You're uh, not just Lin-Manuel Miranda, but also Divi Diggs and and um, and Leslie Odom Jr. and uh, uh, all those folks. And I think um, I think you can I think you can say a lot for how it caused people to think about uh, cast albums differently and Broadway differently. Uh, it's really interesting to see Broadway having a lot of conversations, as everybody is, but specifically conversations around um, about equality and and, tr- and representation because Broadway has a you know a, a huge issue um, in those areas and has for a long time. I think Hamilton has kind of helped push those things a little bit forward and and give uh, voice to more people who care about them. Um, so so I think I would I would name that. Although uh, I also like Beyonce and I'm terrified of her. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this is my true confession to all of you right here. I've never seen Hamilton. I'm sorry, Sam. Is that bad, Sam? <laughs> I, know. I mean, bad. it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. Heard. Well, the thing is, it's like by the time the tickets got cheap enough for me, I had heard all the songs already in the culture. It felt like I had already seen it. I mean, many anyway. people, many people like it. I'm just going to say. <laughs> okay. I might check it out. All right. Maybe. Next question. Jacqueline M. in New York and Monica G. from California both want to know, how do you think your pop culture preferences have changed over the past 10 years, if at all? 
Well, I would say just doing this show over the last 10 minutes, they've just gotten a lot broader. You know, I, I used to be the editor of the AV Club, which is the entertainment section of The Onion. And that compelled me to, li- to watch a lot of movies and, and listen to a lot of music and kind of be a little bit more of a generalist in pop culture. Then I got a job at NPR Music. And for a few years, I was focused entirely on music. And I really kind of fell away from being aware of movies and, and TV shows. And so just doing this show in the last 10 minutes has drastically broaden not only my tastes, but just the, the the overall palette of what I'm exposed to. And so I've learned so much just having to hit those deadlines every week. Uh, it's made me a much more well-rounded consumer of pop culture and has gotten me into things I probably never would have even known existed before. Uh, for me, I mean, I'd like to say that they've widened uh, only because you know, my job now is to help people find things that they wouldn't find on their own. So if I'm out here still recommending the same six things I recommended in 2010, Bony Bear, then I'm not doing anybody <laughs> any uh, any good. I'm kidding. Talk to uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I get, I'm still me, right, though, because I still hate sports and I still don't like rom-coms, although I credit Linda Holmes for allowing me to see that it's not rom-coms the genre that I don't like. It's rom-coms as they've been executed all my life. And now that there are finally some queer rom-coms, I'll go to go to the mat for a good queer rom-com or, or queer uh, rom drama, drum, rom drum. Is that a thing? Uh, like God's own country. I will take half a dozen of that thing. So yeah, I'd like to think they're evolving. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I feel the same way as, as these guys, although I do like the fact that Stephen mentioned twice doing the show in the last 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> which, 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 uh, which, uh, which I agree with. I've learned a lot doing the show in the last 10 minutes also. Um, but I think, um, I think I would say the same thing. I think I've had an, experience, an opportunity to experience more things. I think doing the show has exposed me to a lot more um, different critics and different voices and um, different things. Um, I think I have a better uh, tolerance for sad things than I used to. I think getting kind of more, I'm definitely more knowledgeable about about kind of form directing and and um, the, the form of film than I used to be. And that's just through work and uh, watching and reading about it. Um, so yeah, I think those are, that's probably the way it's changed the most. Cool. All right. I could ask y'all questions about the show for a lot longer, but I can't because we've got to move on. Uh, there are some other parts of the show that we've got to get to. Um, so before we do too much more navel gazing, I want to yield my time to our next host and say before I leave for a bit, uh, it is hard to overstate how much of a big deal pop culture happy hour has been for me and my career. All of the podcast work that I've done here at NPR has been greatly influenced by the conversational tone that you all have set for the network for the last 10 years. Uh, there is no my podcast and lots of other podcasts without uh, the DNA that y'all created. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm-hmm. On that note, I'm going to leave for a bit, but I'll be back. Cheers with my water. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. All right. Uh, I So as Sam said, as we mentioned earlier, we do have another very special guest with us tonight. You know, people throw around the expression, friend of the show, friend of the podcast, is an actual friend of the podcast. Been a friend of the podcast since at least 2015. Uh, and so uh, we want to welcome uh, the star of, uh, among other things, Lovebirds on Netflix with Issa Rae and of the highly anticipated Marvel film, The Eternals. Welcome Kumail Nanjiani. Hi, buddy. Hey, how's it going? Thank you so much for having me. It's going good. I don't know if you've heard this about yourself, but there are many pictures of you uh, kicking around the internet these days. Yeah, they're hard to avoid. <laughs> they're um, out there. Yeah, uh, as many people know, you and your creative partner to whom you are also married, Emily V. Gordon, you guys did a podcast at the, what I would now call the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, there have been so many phases already. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, uh, and that was a terrific podcast for anybody who hasn't already heard it. Uh, what are you doing with yourself now that you're not podcasting? 
Uh, well, basically, when we did that podcast, it was called Staying In with Emily and Kamel, and it was supposed to be Emily's a therapist, and so we were like, and we watch a lot of movies, TV shows, video games, so we were like, okay, so Emily has actual tips, she can, she has advice she can give people on how to get through something like this. And then after a couple of months, we ran out of advice. There's only so, <laughs> so many times you could say, uh, just look after yourself. Uh, be, be careful your own mental health um, and so then we, we kind of stopped doing it um, we've just been sort of writing and um, you know it, it used to be uh, sort of like how's your day going and now it's like every day is every day like I feel like you sort of go through everything <laughs> that you can't possibly go through it every single day but um, uh, it's a uh, it's been it's been does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. You know what? It does. Because I think, and you and I actually, I did your show and, and, and we talked about this a little bit, but I think like every conversation now starts with this feeling of like, how are you doing? And everybody's just like, I don't know. Like, right. <laughs> I mean, what can you really say? What can you really right. say? I think you just have to give yourself space to feel however you're feeling and be okay with it. That's like for me, not to get so serious, but I just, for me, the big breakthrough of quarantine has been if i'm feeling something just like sit it sit in it and feel it don't try to like push it away feel it for a while and just see what happens you know i think it's sort of forced me to do that it's also forced me to understand the importance of quiet i feel like i'm always like running around looking at things and now i'll just like stare out a window for a while <laughs> yeah. that's been really helpful yeah I, I I think by the way, just as an incidental uh, superficial thing, I I think you are in the higher range of quarantine hair out of everyone I know. Uh, in terms of you mean quality or just height? No 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 <laughs> no 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 quality. Like it's it's you have, you have good quality quarantine hair. Thank you. It's been a whole, you know, so it took me a long time to convince Emily to give me a haircut. And at the, by that point, I was like, you know what? It's going to be a badge of honor. We'll see how this looks by the end of it. It, it takes a long time to wrangle and it's 50-50 whether it's going to get wrangled or not. I feel like wrangled okay today. I could show you what it looks like unwrangled, but I, it'll yeah. be hard to then get it back. Yeah, <laughs> it'll never come back. All right. Well, we invited you uh, here to celebrate with us. You were the first person we thought of. Um, but also, as always, we like to uh, force people to try their hand at one of our quizzes. You've done this before with us, actually. Uh, but this time, I am not being tricky. This time, this is crowdsourced. It's kind of like family feud. Uh, we had the audience vote on some uh, of their favorites from the past 10 years. Thanks to all of you guys for doing that. We're gonna ask the, the three of you uh, what you think the audience gave as their answer to each of these questions. Now, there's gonna be six. You will each have a chance to make a guess for each of the six questions. Keep track for yourself of how many you've gotten right. I'm gonna rotate who goes first so that nobody can steal everybody else's answers. You well, may repeat, you may repeat answers. You may all pick the same thing if you like. Um, but, uh, but obviously, if you strike out on your own, you have the chance to gain on your competitors. So, you know. Uh, all right, so first question. Uh, we asked our audience, which of these 2010 movies is the most quintessentially 2010? Is it Eat, Pray, Love, Inception, Easy A, or The Social Network? Kumail, I'll let you go first. Which of these do you think they picked as the quintessential 2010 movie? I would feel like of these, um, Inception is sort of still around, um, uh, Social Network is still around. I would think it would be Eat, Pray, Love. I, I would okay. say that's the most 2010 movie. Kamel goes with Eat, Pray, Love. What do you say, Stephen? I'm going to go with The Social Network just because it was so of its time and yet, you know, has, you know, still speaks to us in a certain way. I think it's Social Network. All right. Glenn, what do you think? Well, real quick, what I love about this is that we're all on an equal playing field. Stephen does not have an advantage because it has nothing to do with the intricacies, the fiendish intricacies of Linda Holmes' mind. Sure. Uh, and and all we have to do is guess what a few thousand librarians slash information specialists slash uh, archivists mm -hmm. think. So I'm going to agree with Stephen. I think it's the social network. All right. And the correct answer is... Oh, wow. yeah. Very good, guys. Nice. Very good. 
I swear to God, I was going to say 46.7% of the audience, <laughs> and I just didn't say it out loud. Should have gone so, out that limb. I would have given you a bonus gone point. Should have gone that limb. Yep. All right. Uh, cool. uh, you if, guys are going to be better at this, aren't you? <laughs> I'm going to have to be gracious, and I'm going to have to pretend to be gracious in defeat. <laughs> If you had to, if you had to binge watch or rewatch one of these beloved series that premiered in 2010, which would it be? Parenthood, Treme, Adventure Time, or Terriers? I'm going to go to you this uh, uh, time, Stephen, for your first answer. Which of these would our audience binge watch or rewatch? I think our audience consists of a lot of weird nerds, and uh, I'm down with that. I'm going to go with Adventure Time. All right, how about you, Glenn? I'm gonna go out on a limb because Adventure Time is still around. You can find it anywhere. Terriers is a cult show that you can't find right now, so I'm gonna go with Terriers. Terriers, how about you, Kamel? You know, I haven't watched any of these shows. You should. Um, so I'm gonna, for, I'm gonna go with Parenthood for no reason. <laughs> All right, Parenthood for no reason. And the answer is? Parenthood! Yes! For no oh! <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. No okay. Reason. All right. For no reason. All back right. I can I can get very competitive, especially when it's something without stakes. So this, yeah. is, this is very good. <laughs> oh, this has no stakes. Absolutely, there are no stakes whatsoever. All right. Uh, you might remember 2010 as the summer of the late night wars, part two, in which Jay Leno lost the Tonight Show and regained the Tonight Show. Which of the following most closely resembles your feelings about all this? Is it A, who watches late night network television? Is it B, Jay Leno got a raw deal? Is it C, Conan forever? Or is it D, I just believe fewer hosts should be named James? Uh, I will go to you first, Glenn. Uh, okay, so... I mean, our, our audience are hip kids with their rumble seats and their raccoon coats and their phone booth stuffing and the goldfish swallowing. And I think they're all going to, they would, if given the points, they would say, you know, uh, who watches late night television? But they're going to be Conan fans and they're going to want to go for the funny answer at the bottom. But at the end, I'm going to say who watches late night television. Okay. So you're going to go with who watches late night television. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, come out. If it was me, I would say Conan forever because Conan is, I mean, he's the reason pretty much I started doing comedy, but I am not the thousands of people who were asked this question. I I don't think many people are going to say, Jill, I don't got a raw deal. So that one <laughs> I will strike. Denim manufacturing. I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking to pull ahead of Glenn, so I don't want to pick the same answer as him. So I'm going to go with the last one, uh, fewer fewer hosts named James. All right. How about you, Thompson? I agree with Kumail. I think that you never go wrong with the joke answer. All right. And the answer is you all lose. Oh, my <laughs> God. I should have gone with my heart. You should have gone with your heart. How many times have we yeah. had this conversation? you got to go with that your is, heart. Jay Leno with Rob did not do well. No, Jay Leno was robbed. Did not did not do well. That is true. No. It did not do well. Uh, all right, we are halfway through the quiz. On to question number four. In 2010, Steve Carell announced that he would be leaving the office. Who should have gotten Michael Scott's job? And this is great because I have no idea whether any of you have watched The Office. Uh, Andy, Dwight, Daryl, or Angela? Hmm. Who first? Yeah, who's starting? Oh, sorry, come out. I have not watched The Office, so Dwight is Dwight Schrute. I know who that is. Who's mm -hmm. Andy? Andy was Ed, Ed Helm. Helm. Uh, Daryl. Craig Robinson. Okay, okay. I and and Angela, I know who Angela is. Okay, okay. so I didn't get as far. I didn't get far enough to see to see Ed Helms. I've only seen the first season and a few episodes of the second season. So I'm going to guess, you know what? I'll go with Andy. Andy. OK. Andy is, by the way, who actually got Michael Scott's job. Uh, oh. Yeah. oh, no. No, 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 no. He was Sorry put up for, uh, he was put up as one of the answers. And you can absolutely vote for that they did it correctly. Uh, all right, uh, Stephen. I think it was actually the right move to have it be Andy. I think the audience is going to say Dwight. Okay. So Stephen says Dwight. Glenn? 
And I believe in our audience, I think Craig Robinson, just on general principles. So Daryl. Yeah. Oh, all right. And the answer is? Good guesses. Oh, it is Daryl. Wow. Nice. It is Daryl. That one was pretty, that one was pretty, uh, even yeah. that one didn't have the, that one wasn't the runaway that some of the other ones were. Mm -hmm. um, Daryl was a strong, strong guess. We're all even, by the way. I think we all have. I have one. The same number of. I've got two. Oh, how many do you have, Kamal? I thought I had two, and I thought Stephen and I. Yeah, I thought I thought I had two, but I don't you know. Two? That's all right. Okay, so we have two more questions of these four songs that topped the year end Hot 100 list at Billboard. Which would you most like to hear right now? Oof. Uh, did our audience say they wanted to hear "TikTok" by Kesha? "Need You Now" by Lady. A to Bellum or whatever they are now. Uh, hey Soul Sister by Train or <laughs> California Girls by Katy Perry. Uh, so we will go to uh, Stephen. Well, I am a big uh, believer. I'm on record as being down with the Keshazants. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm going to go with TikTok. How about you, Glenn? Uh, Kesha, Justice for Kesha. Also, which of these uh, titles is currently a social media platform that I do not understand? Uh, so, <laughs> in, a, in a heartbeat. So you're also picking TikTok. Mm -hmm. All right, come on. Okay. Which one is Need You Now? How does that go? I, I, I <laughs> oh, I, that, I, actually, that helped, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't. Why? I <laughs> I, 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 I don't know that, that one. Okay. Over. I'll go with my heart. I'll go California Girls by Katy Perry. All right. And the correct answer is. Oh, it is. Wow. Look, at that. Uh, look how much wow. the audience loves some TikTok. It's wonderful. 22% of our audience wants to hear Hey Soul Sister. <laughs> <laughs> that is. All of those four songs. That is a data Not point. of all the songs that in the world. That is a data point. Yeah, those are the 22% of people who are saying that's their favorite song in the entire world. Uh, <laughs> all right. This is our final question of our quiz. Which of these pop culture phenomena that were active in 2010 would you most like to firmly leave in the past? Is it A, the situation from Jersey Shore, B, the Vuvuzela, from soccer games, C, sexy vampires from various things, or D, angry birds from your phone. Uh, we will go to Glenn. Uh, it's Vuvuzela in a walk. Way out ahead. I'm Vuvuzela in a walk. All right, uh, Kamel. I still like the Vuvuzela. I think <laughs> sexy vampires are eternal. Um, Angry Birds, I can't see anybody having like a passionate reaction to Angry Birds either way at this point. Uh -huh. Situation. Okay. I'm going to go, I'll go the situation. I'll go the situation. How about you, Thompson? Yeah, I'm actually with Kumail on this one. I think if people had been hearing Vuvuzelas constantly for the last 10 years, that would, that would go, be, wouldn't be in a walk. But I haven't heard of Vuvuzela, I don't think, since... 2010. So I'm gonna and I'm gonna go with the situation. Situation is this capable now? That's what you're saying, your premise. I'm not saying we are still living in like the situation era of of, <laughs> of modern life, but I, I'm just the I'm, age. It just How, okay. it feels like the right answer. How, I will you? say, I ran into some of the situation content last week. I don't remember <laughs> how, but I remember specifically seeing this and being like, oh, not again. So okay. this is a very personal response from me. How about how about the situation blowing a vuvuzela? We definitely do not like that. <laughs> All right, and the correct answer is, oh, it is the situation. <laughs> oh wow, people oh, wanted vuvuzelas the most. <laughs> you know what? Because when I saw it, I was like, oh, vuvuzela. Like oh, I, no. I like, I remember it fondly. Well, it also it also like it sounds like it would be like a little bird, like the vuvuzela was sitting in the tree and singing a little song, you know. It's, yeah, Sports put out adjacent. some bird seed for the vuvuzela. Yeah, put out some bird seed for the vuvuzelas. Uh, all right, right. so um, I believe that our winner. Hang on a second. We're ta we're we are tallying. Tallying. Glenn. 
Stephen Kumail. <laughs> I know it's not me. I got three. All right. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. Okay. So you got Glenn, you got three? Yep. Steven? Three. three. You got I at least three. three but I think I have three, but I'm not sure. I don't know if right. I'm counting Kogan That means we are all equally head. talented. I think. But I don't know. That sounds like a that sounds like a three way that sounds like a three way tie to me, man. Cool. Well, don't take my word for it. I don't. No, I, 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 I. I take your yeah. word. I take your. You seem very trustworthy. There no, but I wasn't, I wasn't. There's some rule followers in the comments. They'll let us know. They will They'll let, let us know. know. Yeah. I. I, so I don't want to be. I don't no. want to be known as a cheater if I, in fact, didn't get three right. No, I'm sure. I think you got at least three right. I think the only risk is that you may have gotten four right. But I. But I. But you got. You got at least three right. I think so. It's definitely a three way tie. Uh, you can, uh, let's see, what shall we do? Yeah, I don't have mm. a tiebreaker. I should have prepared a tiebreaker and I didn't. So unfortunately, it's just a tie. We're celebrating uh, tonight. We're all winners. I was going to say, can I just say, it's in the spirit of the show. It's not a competitive mm -hmm. show. It's a cooperative and collaborative show. Yeah. And, uh, and therefore, it's a three-way tie. And you're all great. Mm -hmm. You're all great. And the yeah, audience. Thanks so much for... By the way, 10 years, that's really exciting. Yeah, oh my yeah. God. Amazing. I mean, the show is essentially a tween now, right? Officially, it's a tween. It's gonna, we're going to get all surly. I was going to say, it's starting Thanks to get so. a little sullen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Going to get dropped off and locked in the mall. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, we really <laughs> I, I have to say, like, we really did not see this. We really did not see this coming, Thompson, when we, when we uh, sat in your living room drinking beer and making up this show. We really did not see this coming. After, uh, the, after the third episode we did of this show, we got an email from the head of news at NPR and we saw the subject line come in and we were like, oh, this is gonna be her saying, what are you doing coming in after hours and doing this show, stop doing it. And it was actually notes and advice on the show. And at that point we were like, well, yeah. I guess we're doing this. So thank yeah. you, Ellen White. Yeah. Uh, yes, we, we, we appreciate. And, and by the way, to all of you who RSVP'd for this event and answered all these silly questions that I made up, we really super extremely, extremely appreciate it. Um, we are, uh, by the way, getting <laughs> late breaking news that uh, according to the people in the comments, it is Glenn three and the other two of you two. Oh, according I definitely to got three. Stephen, but Stephen really thinks he got two, he got three. We're gonna have to. We're, I'm All just right. gonna tell you. All right. We're gonna do an audit. We're gonna do an audit. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna do an audit. Stephen's okay. mom is defending him. <laughs> is story checks. All right. Out. Story checks. Out. I think Stephen. I think Stephen should get it then. Yeah. Stephen's totally. Mom, I, 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 I right. abdicate. I abdicate. <laughs> we're gonna. I do can an bet audit. thousands of dollars on the fact that my mom is not. <laughs> we are going to uh we're going to do an audit we're going to get a final answer but for the time being uh it would not be pop culture happy hour if we did not close it out with what's making us happy let's start with our guest of honor kumail nagiani what is what is making you happy this week buddy so i will say since quarantine emily and i have been very very serious about quarantine we don't really leave the house this is pretty much my life um, at night, we'll go on a, on a walk, and we've been cooking every meal every single day, except about a month and a half into quarantine, we instituted on Friday night's date night, and that's the only night we get takeout. So what's making me happy this week is what makes me happy every week, and that is food made by other people. <laughs> because I know all my moves, and I am sick of them. <laughs> That is I will say I've got very good at rolling a burrito. I have figured out how to roll a burrito. I used to think they would use some sort of food glue to do it, but it's not. <laughs> um, and uh, part of the trick is you have to heat up the tortilla enough so that it's pliable, but not so much that it loses its structural integrity. So it's still robust while you're eating it. So I'm also quite happy that I know how to Roll a tortilla now. Roll a, roll a burrito. That's excellent. That's excellent. Rolling a burrito and food made by other people. Uh, how about you, uh, Stephen Thompson? What is making you happy this week? 
Well, I talked about this a little bit on Twitter, so bear with me if you happen to have seen that thread. Uh, we are recording this on July 30th, and last week they held a virtual San Diego Comic-Con. And at the virtual San Diego Comic-Con, they held a virtual Eisner Awards, which is kind of like the Oscars of the comic book industry. And I do recommend that people watch it. It's full of great recommendations for great comic books. But at the end of that ceremony, they announced eight entries in the Eisner Awards Hall of Fame. And you know these included some big names, people like Bill Watterson and Alison Bechtel, and also my parents, uh, Don and Maggie Thompson. Uh, they are uh, they are sort of pioneers of comic book fandom. They uh, wow. published one of the first comic book fanzines starting in like 1960. They edited a magazine called Comics Buyer's Guide for years and years and years. I cannot overstate how much their careers influenced my own career as a sort of professional enthusiast. They also helped teach the world about the power of comic books as an art form and helped comic books become, uh, you know, kind of taken more seriously. They are also not for nothing, absolutely wonderful people. My father sadly died in, in 1994. My mother is still very much with us and an occasional guest on Pop Culture Happy Hour and one of my favorite people in the world. I'm so proud of them. I'm so pleased for them. I do highly recommend watching the Eisner Awards. It's on YouTube. You get to about the 49 minute mark and you can hear my dear mother, Maggie Thompson, uh, deliver a really beautiful speech. So that is what is making me very, very happy this week. Woohoo! Congratulations! Wow, fantastic! That is beautiful. How exciting! Wow, you come from good stock, fantastic. buddy. Good people. Yeah, good my stock. mom makes my mom makes really good biryani. <laughs> I think, I think Counts. that's Counts. comparable. I saw, I saw a whole movie about that. Um, all right, so uh, I, as you know, Stephen is talking about his family. Uh, I love my dog like my family. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, the thing that is making me happy this week, and frankly, I'm offended that I did not already know about this, but the new streaming service, HBO Max, which is one of those that you have to just go look and see what's on it because you can't tell what's on it, has a show called The Dog House. And it is about, <laughs> it is about a shelter, a, like a, it's like a shelter, it's like a rescue in the UK, but like a big kind of, you know, roomy rescue with lots and lots of dogs. And it's about the process of people coming and adopting rescue dogs. So you see like the family comes and the people at the rescue say like, what kind of dog are you looking for? And then they show the dogs in the little pens and how they're all excited because they want to be adopted. And it is true, you have to be a little bit, you know, you have to be a little bit tough because every once in a while there is one that doesn't work out because they want to be honest about the fact that, you know, the fact that some adoptions don't don't turn out to be a good match is part of the deal. Some of the dogs have sad backstories. That's how they wind up at the rescue in the first place. But for the most part, you see a lot of people really just playing with beautiful new dogs and and adopting pets. And considering how much I I, I love rescue dogs, uh, I, I very much uh, embrace it's, it. There are eight episodes of it. It's on HBO Max. Again, the dog house. It's uh, very, very wonderful. And it is what is making me happy this week. And uh, our friend Chris Klemek, one of our fourth chairs, told me that it is the only reality show he has ever liked because it has a, uh, a big, tough man who had part of his leg amputated, uh, who develops a um, love bond with a dog named Zeus. And it's very true. And it is a really, really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. So the dog house on HBO Max is what is making me happy this week. Glenn I was Weldon. thinking what could be more adorable than rescue dogs. And the answer is British rescue dogs. That's true. <laughs> it, is, it is absolutely true. Uh, Glenn Weldon, what is making you happy this week? Okay, cover me. I'm going in. Uh, on August 14th, uh, Dua Lipa will drop a remix of her song Levitating. Uh, it's featured on her new album, Future Nostalgia. Um, said remix will feature the song stylings of one Missy Elliott and, uh, and Madonna. Now, hear me out. <laughs> I chose this happy three days ago before Madonna went and showed her entire butt on Instagram by saying something. I think it's safe to say dangerously asinine. Uh, it's Madonna. It's not the first time. It won't be the last. But I was I was going to come up with something else. But then I listened to this, the great and good Stephen Thompson, who sagely reminded me 
that the good that is Dua and the good that is Missy is sure to overpower Madonna's dump. Uh, and, and, and speaking of power, and the reason I chose this is because of power, because of what it represents. Because if you think about it, these three women represent um, a, a coming together, a collab, a, uh, I was going to say pairing, but it's like a, a triune that is truly mythic. Together they are the triple goddess. Think about it. They are maiden mother crone, right? They're the weird sisters. They're the graces. They're the fates. There's a power here. And uh, I'm just saying, uh, it's coming and we have to get ready for it. If you've got uh, loins, you're going to want to gird them. Uh, and, and to the international shipping maritime industry and to the recreational boaters out there, I say, this will affect the tides. So you got to <laughs> factor that in. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, Dua Lipa remix of, levi of le levitating uh, feet, period, uh, Missy Elliott and other uh, on August 14th. This is by so you far. haven't heard this song yet. Uh, we haven't heard the song yet, but just the promise, you know, <laughs> with a big asterisk. <laughs> so, <laughs> asterisk. Hope, hope is making you happy. The hope, hope is that making you me happy. Know, yes, you will love it. That's it. I think this is definitely like that little way that you said feet. Period. <laughs> yep. it, even for this show, pretty square. I'm just going <laughs> <laughs> to say. And not denied. Square. No denial here. Where is the line? Pretty square. Uh, I appreciate all of you uh, telling us what's making you happy this week. Kamel, we're going to let you go. We appreciate you so much, buddy. It has been so good to have you here. As I said, genuine friend of the show, not just a friend of the show, friend of the show, but a true friend of the show. We appreciate it. Thanks. Bob. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I was so excited when you, when you, when you asked me to do this. Um, yeah, I've been a fan of the show for, you said 2015. I don't remember a long time. And during this this uh, quarantine, you know, I've been I've been listening to every episode, and you guys have been one of my sort of lifelines tethering me to normalcy. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for having me. It's been awesome. And before I leave, I should say uh, I think someone has a special surprise for you. <gasps> a surprise! I love a surprise. I'm back. Hey, man. Is it Sam? Is Sam the surprise? I'm not that <laughs> That was smooth. That was smooth. I'll take it. I, yeah, yeah. So I will, before I get to the surprise, I, I got to tell the story. I can't not tell the story. Yesterday during run through, we were going through um, the what's making everyone happy and the topic of train and their awful hit Hey Soul Sister came up. Oof. And I had the chance to tell Pop Culture Happy Hour, my favorite urban legend ever of all time. The urban legend is this, that the lead singer of Train actually wrote the lyrics of Hey Soul Sister to describe his first time dating a black woman. Okay. Think about that now. No. You're never going to forget it's, that. You have to carry yeah. this burden forever. You, you, can't un, you can't unknow it once <laughs> Sam tells it. <laughs> and watching all of their faces as this reality washed over them. <laughs> priceless. Yeah. And like when you think through the receipts, Makes sense. I'm so gangster. You're so thug. Watching you cut a rug. Come on. Wikipedia oh. says that he was writing about imagining watching women dance at Burning Man. But I said, no. Yeah. I'm sticking with my uh -huh. theory. And watching y'all have to face that with me this week was uh, <laughs> what made me happy this week. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> I um, as a fourth chair of the show, we wanted to do a nice thing with some other fourth chairs and um, wish y'all a very happy 10th birthday. So here it is. Aww. Hey, PCHH. Hey, Pop Culture Happy Hour. Hey, PCHH. Hey, PCHH. We wanted to wish you a happy, happy birthday. From what's making us happy this week. To the best books, music, movies, and TV. Thanks for all that you do. And the joy that you create. And letting us be a part of it. Cheers. 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 That was very cool. And Clemic with the Superman curl. <laughs> that, is a, cool. that is amazing. I just want to give everyone happy, a happy second. Birthday. Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to give everybody a second to recover 
from how good looking so many of our four kids are. <laughs> That's what's happening right now. All these people are going, I had no idea these people were so good looking. They're all right, beautiful. Exactly. They're all good looking, including you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so we appreciate so much, of course, our, our fourth chairs. They make the show what it is. As we said before, we started this as some pals. And I think with just the four of us, it would never have survived. Um, I don't think anybody would listen to it. I don't think we'd still want to do it. Um, I appreciate We appreciate, of course, Trey, who started the show with us and Absolutely. all of our fourth chairs. Um, we appreciate uh, our producers so much. Um, oh my Mike, Mike Katzif, who started the show with us and is now back with us. Jessica Reedy, who has produced for years um, and, and is also our, our, our North Star. Uh, everybody who produced in between the two of them, oh uh, Jess and, and Nick and Lauren and, uh, and, and uh, Emmanuel, and I'm forgetting people, but everybody who's even stepped in to guest produce. Yep. Um, we appreciate everybody. Our producers are uh, our, our our survival. Um, and before you uh, before you go, uh, uh, we do want to make sure that um, uh, we do want to make sure that you know that uh, you can do a couple of things to help support us. We know that money is super super tight right now, and uh, one of the things that you can do to support us is totally totally free. If you there is a uh, there is a survey that you can fill out for us. Um, I think it's in the uh, I think it's in the chat slash comments, um, or it'll be in your inboxes later. If you fill that out, as you can tell, we're still figuring out how to do live events, and uh, that will really help us um, improve. And you can also support our work. We say this over and over again. Sam has said this over and over again. It is so important um, that if you want to support us, that you support your local member station. Uh, that is um, that is our lifeline. And uh, we appreciate our stations. We appreciate all of our local stations. And thank you so much for joining us from around the country and around the world. Again, uh, our production team that made this happen, Jessica Reedy, Mike Katzif, Ali Prescott, uh, Joanna Pulowska, uh, and of course, Adam Birnbach for the tasty drink recipes. Uh, and Kumail Nanjiani, we appreciate mm -hmm. Kumail very much. Hi, buddy. We brought you back by surprise. <laughs> Wave one last time. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to our audience. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, love to you, uh, PCHH team, uh, Stephen, Glenn, Jess, Mike. Um, and, and all of our guests, we appreciate you. And, and thanks to you guys for being here. Please join me. I've almost finished my drink, but uh, let us cheers to 10 years together. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching and listening. And we will see you uh, tomorrow morning. It's gonna be Indian matchmaking. Yes, it is. <laughs> Team Aparna. Team Aparna. Yeah, good night and cheers. <laughs>